please welcome Max Stoiber. Hey everybody, my name is Max. I'm back to talk about your absolutely favorite topic, CSS. Yay! <laughs> don't we all love CSS? Um, in case you don't know who I am, my name is Max. Um, you can follow me on Twitter with that Twitter handle right there. Um, if you think that looks really, really complicated and you'll never remember it, it's just my name without vowels. All right, so just remember my name, take out the vowels, and you'll have my Twitter handle. I'm the technical co-founder of a newly founded startup called Space Program, which I think is the fucking coolest name ever for any company. The CTO of a company called the Space Program. I mean, come on. Um, and we're building a platform for communities called Spectrum. I am in a bajillion Slack teams, right? Every single month, there's new communities appearing that live on Slack, which isn't actually made for communities. It's made for businesses. And the conversations there are really hard to follow. If you have a big community with thousands of members, it starts breaking down. You don't see your messages anymore. Conversations get lost, and it really doesn't work. And people have started looking for alternatives, but all the alternatives aren't made for communities either. So we're building a platform to fix that. Um, and you can check it out right now. And there's a React frequency, which is sort of like a community. So you can go to spectrum.chat slash tilde react. You can see what we've built so far. It's really, we're currently in, in beta, so don't tell anybody about this, like me, right now. Um, but please try it out and let us know what you think. And Spectrum is built with React, right? And we, and especially the people, you, that are here, we're now in what I like to call the component age, right? We've gone from HTML documents and um, very basic text to rich interactive applications that live on the web. And we've discovered that the original model of the web documents doesn't really work perfectly or very well for big interactive user interfaces, right, built by hundreds of developers at the same time. And so we started thinking about how can we make that better and arrived at this model of small encapsulated components, right, Lego blocks, that we build more complex user interfaces out of. As we've done that, we've also discovered some best practices, right? The first one is that we want to have small and focused components, right? They should be encapsulated. They should be like Lego blocks. And the second is that we split containers and components. Now, with small focused components, I mean that they're sort of very easy to understand, right? For example, you have a button component. You don't want people to have to understand what exactly that button component does. They should just be able to use it throughout your entire application and just have a button there. And it works exactly how they'd expect, right? Now, previously with styling, we used to do something um, like this, right? You'd have a button component, and you'd have people assign a class name. So in this case, our class name is button. And then if you wanted a more important button, you maybe, you maybe had a button dash dash primary class that you could also assign to make it more bigger and more important, right? So this would be the BEM naming convention. But the thing is, with components, we don't really need those class names, right? These are implementation details. Which specific class names my button component uses my users of that component shouldn't have to care about that, really. They shouldn't have to know that to use my button component, I also have to use a button class. It doesn't make sense. We already have the component which encapsulates everything, so why, ex why do we extract the class name? It doesn't make sense. Rather, with React, it's very common to do something like this, where you just have a button component, and then you have a button component that's set to primary, right, where the primary property is set to true. The second best practice that I just mentioned is splitting containers and components. Um, and splitting containers and components is extremely nice. This is what it looks like, right? This might be a typical component that you have in your application. You have a sidebar, which fetches some data from some API, and then renders the item that it gets back from the API. But this is sort of conflating two different things. This is managing and fetching data, but also at the same time cares about styling, right? Splitting containers and components, we've sort of started doing something like this in the React community, right? And that switch was very fast, so I'm going to do it again, right? This is the original component. This is what it looks like afterwards, right? It's a very tiny change. But we now have a sidebar com container component which cares about the data fetching. And then we have smaller components like a sidebar and a sidebar item that care about specifically what the sidebar does, right? But they don't care about fetching data and passing it in the right format. And that, that gives us, as developers, a very nice way of working with the application. Because if you think about your application as a tree of components, with containers, you have these sort of intermediary levels of data management and then, and then other levels about styling and behavior. And it's very nice to work with because I know where to go and to look for a bug, right? If I look in the React DevTools and I see, oh, 
the properties that my sidebar component received had a totally wrong format, I know I need to go look in the container. If the behavior is wrong, I know I need, need to go look into the sidebar component. With those best practices in component-based systems, oh, sorry, so to sum things up, the short version, basically, is that containers care about how things work, and components care about how things look, right? That's sort of the short version. The thing is that in, with these best practices in component-based systems, we also discovered some best practices about styling, right? Because CSS was made in an age where the web was made for scientific documents, right? It was made in 1995 when the web mostly consisted of some text, right? And initially, the browsers didn't even want to implement something like CSS. They wanted to be the ones dictating what web pages should look like because it was made for scientific papers, right? Why would you have scientists have spent days thinking about how exactly their H1 looks when they really just want to write their scientific papers, right? It doesn't make any sense. So, but in the end, obviously, the web wasn't just used for scientific documents, and they relented and added CSS. Now, in component-based systems, we've also discovered some best practices, right? The first is that we have single-use classes. If you think about it, if you have a button component that's encapsulated and is a button, that might have a class name like our button previously, a button class name. But you wouldn't reuse that button class name anywhere else, right? Because if another developer then comes in and you know, wants to change the styling of the button, obviously, they go looking for the button class. If you use that anywhere else, it breaks unrelated parts of the application really surprisingly. Right, it's the old bug where in CSS you change some CSS property of some tiny piece of your application down here, and your whole layout just shifts and everything breaks, and you're like, what? What is going on? And that's mostly due to people using class names more than once. And with components, we can just use every class name once and then reuse that component throughout our application. Right? If we have a button component, let's just reuse that button component throughout our app and just put the class name in our component. The second best practice is that we use components as a styling construct. And this is a bit unusual, I think, still. Um, but it's, for example, having a grid component and having a column component, having a row component that you reuse throughout your application to get very consistent grids and very consistent layouts, right? Where these components don't necessarily have any specific behavior associated, but they're very much focused on what the styling looks like. But I can look in a component, I can see immediately, OK, this is sort of what it should look like. And does it actually look like it? And it's really, really nice to use. Michael Chan um, wrote this great article a while back about styling in React. And he had this quote in there, which is, if you're writing React, you have access to a more powerful styling construct than CSS class names. You have components. And I think that's very much the crux of why the whole community has sort of moved towards this encapsulation model. Because we have components. We can share them. We can reuse them. We don't need to reuse CSS class names with naming conditions. We can just reuse our components, right? This is a really important point, and it's what everybody's been sort of thinking about and trying to solve. The thing with all of these best practices and all of these ideas is that they're completely useless if they're not enforced, right? We have to get stuff done. Obviously, right? Everybody has to get stuff done. That's the whole point of programming. We want to get, we want to get somewhere. And if we have best practices that stand in our way and that block us and make us slow, we're not going to adhere to them. Obviously, I, wouldn't, I won't adhere to any best practices that take me ages to figure out, right? I just want to write my application. And that's why we made styled components. It's one of the core ideas of styled components and why it exists. Styled components, for those of you who don't know it, is made by Glenn Madden and myself. Um, Glenn is, you might know, as being one of the co-creators of CSS modules. And I went to Australia, and we sort of sat down and thought about styling in component-based systems further and came up with what is now styled components. The kind of weird idea in styled components is that it removes the mapping between styles and components, right? Because if you think about it, if you only ever use every class name once, why do you have a class name at all? Right? A class name is a mapping between a piece of CSS, some styling, a style fragment, and an HTML DOM node, right? a simple HTML tag. But if you only ever use that mapping once, why do you have a mapping at all? It's totally unnecessary. So this is what styled components looks like. Um, the first time Glenn showed me the very early prototype of what was going to become styled components, I looked at it and I went, you are crazy. This looks absolutely ridiculous. Why would I ever use this? But then I tried it, right? And I did something, you know, just because for the sake of it, because I wanted to try it. I built something like a to-do list in 15 minutes. And 
After 15 minutes, I looked at Glenn and I went, holy cow, I never want to style any of my applications any different way ever again. So let's take a look at this. The first thing we do here is we import styled from styled components. Very fancy, it's an import. The second thing we do is, and this is where it starts getting weird, const title equals styled.h1, and then a back tick at the end. This styled.h1 thing is a function, right? And this function returns a React component that renders an h1 HTML tag, right? So our title variable here is now a React component that we can use like any other React component in, in our application, and it'll render an h1 heading. And then we do this back tick thing and pass in some styles into this practic thing, right? We write some CSS. In this case, our H1 should have a font size of 1.5 VM, should be aligned to the center, and should have a color of pale violet red. Now, this weird backting thing, which I've been saying as that weird backting thing for a while now, um, is actually an ES2015 feature, right? It's JavaScript. It's called a tagged template literal. Um, so if you think about template literals, you know, the strings where you can interpolate things, tagged template literals are the exact same thing, except you call functions with them. So here, we call style.h1 with a string that contains this CSS, right? Now, there's some fine differences between calling functions with parentheses, like you do generally, and calling functions as a tag template literal, but you can look those up in the spec. So we call style.h1 with a string of CSS, and that returns a React component which renders an h1 HTML tag, and that is now our title. Our wrapper is the exact same thing. Our wrapper is a React component that renders an HTML tag section, and it has a color of pale violet red, a width and height of 100%, some padding, and a background of papaya red. Right? Now, these are just React components, like any other React components you have in your application. So you can render them like any other React components. Right? There's nothing special about those. You can just put them in a JSX. And when you look in the browser, what you see is a section that has a papaya red background and a heading, an H1, that is pale violet red and aligned in the center. Right? Surprisingly. Now, something that's a bit weird about styled components as well is that, as you see, you write actual CSS in JavaScript. Right? And that was a very deliberate decision we made. Because CSS inherently isn't a bad language. CSS is awesome. Right? We're, CSS it was made to style arbitrary content on, in arbitrary width devices, supporting thousands of different users at the same time with different constraints. Right? CSS as a language works perfectly well. CSS is amazing. Um, it was just, there's just parts of it that we don't think work very well in component-based systems, right? It just wasn't made in an era where components were a thing people talked about, right? And so styled components let you write actual CSS because CSS is perfectly fine. And we make it better and enhance it with JavaScript. But that also means that you have full support for anything in CSS that you want. Because it's just JavaScript, uh, because it's just JavaScript, of course. Because it's just CSS. You can use media queries, you can use nesting, you can use anything you can think of. So here we have a color changer component, which again renders a HTML section. And this color changer component has a background of papaya width. And any heading within that color changer component has a color of pale violet width. But then we have a media query. And on certain sized screens, the background switches to medium sea green and the color to papaya width. Right? And if we look at this in the browser and resize it a bit, you'll see that the background changes at the width of 875 pixels. Right? Now, there's nothing fancy going on here. This is just CSS. Right? It's just a media query. You've all seen this before. You've all used it before. It's just to demonstrate that, that we let you write actual CSS. Your designers can go in and write the CSS that they're used to. Right? It's just CSS. There's nothing fancy about it. Another thing that we built into styled components is adapting based on properties. Right? If you remember back to the first example I showed you of our button component, that button has a primary property. Right? And we want to make it bigger and more important if it's primary, and a bit less important if it isn't primary. So how do we do that with styled components? Well, because we use tag template literals, you can interpolate functions. Right? So you can interpolate a function, and that function gets passed the properties of the component. So here we're basically saying, if the primary property is set to true, make the background pale violet red, otherwise make the background white. And the color the exact other way around. If the primary property is set, make the color white, otherwise make the color pale violet red. Now you use, these, you use this like any other React component, right? You just say button or button primary. And if you render these two buttons in your browser, you'll see a normal button and a primary button, right? So this is how you adapt based on properties with styled components. Now, when we tried different libraries, obviously, 
when I started on this whole exploration of how do I style my React applications, I didn't want to, I didn't think I was going to build another, another CSS and JS library, right? There's 50 out there, why do we need another one? Um, but the thing is, there's one fundamental thing that many of them were missing that I need in my applications, which is theming, right? If you encapsulate your components and you don't give anybody access to themes, they now look the way they do and you can never change them, right? But really, in many cases, I want my application in different parts of the application look it was a slightly different, right? I maybe want to tweak some colors. I want to have some global variables that I use throughout my application, and maybe even can update dynamically. So Style Components has built-in support for theming. Um, we export this theme provider component, and then you define any theme that you can think of. So in this case, we're saying the primary color of our theme is pale violet red, right? And then we just wrap our components, our entire app, in a theme provider and pass that theme to it. And now any styled components can adapt based on this theme which looks like this, right? Again, we have a function interpolation, and we inject props.theme from the context of this component. So here we say the background of our button should be whatever the primary color is in our theme. Now, if we render this in a browser as is, inside of our single theme provider, it'll obviously have a pale violet red background color because that is our primary theme. But you can also have multiple themes inside of your app. So here, we create two themes. We have a red theme and we have a green theme. Right? And let's say I want to have the main area of my application be red and the sidebar be green because design us, right? I can just render two theme providers and wrap different parts of my application in different themes. And my components adjust automatically. Look at how we don't pass any prop to this component to change its styling. We don't do anything with, to the component to change its styling. We just render them in different contexts, right? And if we look at this in a browser, we get a red button and a green button. Now, the thing is, this uses React's context feature. So it works as many levels deep as you want. Right? It doesn't matter how many divs or, com or components or whatever are in between your theme provider and your styled components, they'll still get the theme. Now, we finished styled components, I don't know, half a year ago, the first, a very first prototype right? that looked sort of like what it looks like right now. And we started using it in our applications because you know, we don't want to release something without having actually used it. I mean, that doesn't work out because maybe it has some fat fail of laws and we were totally on the wrong track. And so I, we, we built our apps with it and we started using it in actual projects. And then I had to build a React Native app. And I had to go back to writing fake CSS in JavaScript objects. And I thought, actually, I just want to use styled components for my React Native application. Why do I have to go back to writing styles in JavaScript objects now? I'd rather just use styled components. And so we added full React Native support to styled components. It looks almost exactly the same, right? We import style from style-component slash native. And this slash native import gives us access to the React Native primitives, right? So we can now do const wrapper equals style.view. And view, for those of you who might not have used React Native, is sort of like a div on the web is except for React Native, right? And then we pass in some styles. We use the background colors papaya whip, and it should justify its content and align its items to the center. So everything should, should, should just be centered within our wrapper. And then we have a title, title which is just style.text. And text, again, is just a React Native primitive. right? It's kind of like a, like a heading or like a paragraph on the web. And then we just pass it some, some CSS. right? So we say it should have a font size of 20, should be landed in the center, should have a color of pale violet red, all those things. And then we can render those like any other React components. Oops. Render those like any other React components inside of our React Native application. And when we look at this on our phone, it looks like this just styled components. The thing is, this is an actual screenshot from my phone, right? The, obviously, the thing around it is not my phone, but the screenshot is from my phone. And when, when we first got this to work, I flipped out because I didn't think we were going to make it work, right? But it works now, and you can actually use it, and we do use it. Now, I can stand here all day long and tell you how great styled components is. And I would. I would love to. But sadly, I only have 30 minutes. But there's other people who also love styled components. For, for example, you have Sebastian who is actually sitting in a crowd somewhere, who recently tweeted, I fucking love styled components. So good. Thank you for making my life easier. There is Griffin, who works at Reddit, who can't say enough good things about styled components. Right? There is Pablo, who migrated some SAS to styled components as a therapeutic exercise. <laughs> um, I'm not a doctor. right? I don't know if that's a good idea. But I mean, if it works for you, right? if you're a bit stressed, maybe try migrating some SAS to styled components. <laughs> There's Max, who thinks he fell in love with styled components, which 
is also pretty weird when you think about it. Um, I think maybe you should, you know, get some therapy. Um, and there's a bunch of other people who also say and love styled components just because it's so great to use, right? It's very pleasant to use. You can, inst you can get styled components right now by just doing npm install style. Oh, wait. That's not a thing anymore. Yeah, by doing yarn add styled components. <laughs> um, we're also on GitHub, so if you go to github.com slash style components slash style components, you'll find our repo, you'll find the full source code. Please submit issues and pull requests. And um, before I go on and start answering your questions, there's one last thing I want to talk about here. Often when I talk about style components, um, people come up to me afterwards and ask me, you know, we have an existing code base, we use SAS, or I want to use SAS in my style components code, right? Because it is just CSS, it seems not too far-fetched that you could use some SAS features in there, right, like mixins. But we do have the power of JavaScript, right? So let's take a look at some SAS code. This is a mixing called Tone, which takes a property, a color, and then how much you would lighten and desaturate um, the color. And then it just sets the property to the desaturated and lightened color. Now, if we look at this, right, the mixing, how do we transfer that to styled components without adding SAS features to styled components, right? How, how can we use JavaScript to make this happen? If we look at this, the first thing that's a bit you know, interesting is that this mixin sort of looks like a JavaScript function, right? <coughs> the mixin isn't that different from a function. So we can replace this and call it a function, right? Now it's a function, a normal JavaScript function that's called tone. But then what do we do with this inner part? What, what is that? How, how do we do that in JavaScript? Really, this is just a return, right? So we can just return a property rather than just inlining it with a mixin. And then there's the most inner part, right? And here it gets a bit tricky because how do we do desaturate and lighten in JavaScript? Right? Those are SAS-specific functions. What do we do? And a lot of people have had this issue, or not have had this issue, but have thought about this and didn't really know what to do. Um, and of course, you can use styled components perfectly fine alongside an existing code base, but many people want to migrate for the amazing development experience because you are going to change your CSS, right? And so today, I'm incredibly excited to announce Polished, which is a lightweight toolset for writing styles in JavaScript, right? It's sort of the low dash of writing styles in JavaScript. It's completely cross-framework compatible, so it doesn't matter if you're, if you're using styled components or not. If you're writing styles in JavaScript, you can use Polished. And Polished basically gives you access to a huge amount of useful functions, right? So we have a desaturated and lightened function. Um, the only difference to SAS is that the arguments are inverted because we went with the functional style. So all of polished utils are curryable, right? You can compose them together, they're curried. You can compose them together and create your own little helper functions. Um, there's a huge list of functions we've built. Um, we have a lot of color stuff that you might want to use. There's some mixins, um, some shorthands. Um, and we are really, really excited about this project because we think it's going to help a lot of people to move towards styled in, styles in JavaScript, right? And that's not necessarily means that you have to use styled components or anything. Polished works with whatever styles in JavaScript library you use or you want to use. Um, you can get Polished right now. We just published it an hour ago. So you can yarn add Polished to install it in your application. Um, we're also on GitHub. If you go to github.com slash styled components slash polished, you'll find all the source code, all the issues. Um, if you have ideas for new helpers that we should add, let us know. If you have bugs, if you find bugs by using it, definitely let us know and we'll get them fixed. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. All right, questions. Um, is there any performance impact of using styles in JavaScript instead of native CSS? That is a very good question um, and one that you should be asking. Um, there was a tweet that went out um, a few days ago by one of the thought leaders in the web space who um, basically said, don't use styles in JavaScript because it has a performance impact. And that is true, right? Obviously, rendering your styles from JavaScript does have a performance impact, and we're very acutely aware of that we being me and Glenn and all the other contributors to styled components. The thing is, with styled components, we took the approach of making it work, making it right, and then making it fast, 
Because we didn't know if it was going to work out. We didn't know if people were going to like style components, right? We had no idea if this was something that people want to use. Obviously, that's the case. So now we're really hard at work at making it right and making it fast. Um, there's Phil, who is somewhere in the crowd as well, whom we should definitely talk to. He's now written a Babel plugin, which pre-processes and pre-passes your styled component CSS, which means we don't have to do any parsing at runtime anymore, right? And we're looking towards building upon that some extraction features so you can actually get a static CSS file again for your styled component CSS, for the non-dynamic parts, that is. Obviously, the, the dynamic parts have to stay in JavaScript because they're dynamic. If you're server-side rendering, by the way, um, version 2 of styled components, which is almost done, it's like a week or two away from release, um, has full has official server-side rendering support. We've always had server-side rendering support. We just didn't export it, which is pretty stupid. But you know, So with version 2, we've added an official API. It's going to be in the docs. You can use server-side rendering with styled components, which also gets rid of um, the performance impact. Um, in general, I'd say there is a performance impact, but we can fix that. It's temporary. It's nothing that we stick around forever, right? We're, we're, we're working really, really hard to make styled components as, just as fast as native CSS, or just make it native CSS, right? That's the whole goal, and we're, very, we're working really hard at it. That's basically it. Um, the second question is, don't styled components incur a lot of code duplication CSS in the rendered HTML? I'm unsure if I understand that question, um, because if you're using components, the styling for that component should only ever live with that component, right? So if you have a CSS file, if you're using, for example, CSS modules, you have just the exact same amount of CSS as you would have in styled components. There's nothing that styled components does differently here um, rather than CSS modules. Now, if you mean um, injection, how injection works, that's a whole different discussion. That's really technical, how we inject the CSS. Um, and you, I encourage you, Nathan, to submit an issue and come talk to us about it, because if I start talking about this now, everybody's going to start sleeping. And I really don't want that. Um, but the answer is not. Style components doesn't do anything different here from CSS modules or any other styling method. How do you control positioning and layout from parent to child? Do you have to write layout components? Um, that is another really good question. Um, we realized that many of the existing styles in JavaScript libraries um, didn't let users do nesting, right? Be you were writing styles as JavaScript objects, but you didn't have any access to the, parent, uh, to, to, to the child components from your parent. Um, so we have added nesting support. But obviously, that's not optimal either, because if you have styled components, you just want to select those styled components, the class names that we generate, not just any random H2 inside of your color changer component. Right? So with style components version 2, there will be an option to just select a style component. So you can interpolate a style component, and it will put the class name of that style component into your CSS. So you can control specifically which style components you want to style from that parent if it's within, you know, if it's a child, if it's a child of that component. Um, the question about exporting styles I've already answered. Um, then there's a really good question. How do you solve global styling? There is global styling, right? Even, with, even in encapsulated component-based systems, you still have global styling. And again, this is something that not many styles in JavaScript libraries did previously, right? Um, they all encapsulated the styles, but they didn't give you an escape hatch. They, they, they didn't give you a way out. So style components has an inject global helper with which you can just inject global styles, right? Specifically for the use case of having a font face. How would you render if a font face isn't encapsulated, right? No matter where you put it in your CSS, it's global. So we have an helper and, and, an, and an escape hatch for writing global CSS, because sometimes you do want to have global CSS. Then there's a question, what are the limitations of styled components? That's an interesting question. Um, I think, for most people, the main limitation right now is performance. Um, because if you have a huge, I'm invoking massive application with lots of dynamic styling, that does have a performance impact right now. Um, and that's why we're working on solving it, because we don't, we don't want anybody to not use styled components just because it, the performance is bad, right? That's an engineering problem. That's not your issue. That's ours, right? That's our fault. So we're working extremely hard at fixing that. That's probably the biggest limitation of styled components. Um, can't think of anything else, to be honest. <laughs> um, then David asks, when props change, does all the CSS get recompiled? That's a good question. Um, no. When properties change, we only recompute and reinject the CSS that changed. 
right? Because you don't want to inject your style sheet, the whole style sheet, every single time anything changes. That doesn't make any sense, right? So we just we are very acutely aware of being as performant as possible and only injecting the minimal amount of CSS that we need to. Anonymous asks, can you use auto? I love anonymous. Oh, man. Anonymous questions are the best. No, I'm just kidding. Um, can you use auto prefix and or post CSS slash CSS next, etc.? cetera? Um, style component automatically auto prefixes your CSS. Um, so you don't have to worry about it. The question about post CSS is an interesting one. Because if you think about the things you use in your CSS preprocessor, most of them, as I showed, actually exist in JavaScript. Right? Most of the features you use from your preprocessor exist in JavaScript. So like the mixing I just showed, you can just write a JavaScript function, right? For light and dark, we now have polished. There still is some things that you might want to use, like CSS Next. Um, and so we are thinking about adding a preprocessing step that lets you use arbitrary CSS transforms before you send the code down the browser. Um, but that's not something we've started working on it because we want to work on performance first, and we need to nail that before we look towards adding additional en en enhancements to it. And I think that's my time. Thank you very much for having me.